Hey, you guys. Let's jump into this real quick. Oh, that is not supposed to be that way. Let's try this real quick. Think that's better? All right. So we're going to try and manage the comments today, too. Yeah. I, I think it's working. Let me know at the video or in the audio is good. Um, cause I really can't tell. But for some reason, my phone was blowing up. So I don't know if that was not working or if it was working. And I just didn't know at this time. We'll see. Um, yeah, so I have easel open up here. Let's jump over to that uh, display real quick. And uh, I got a few bits. I'm just going to show you, like, start off with just showing how to enter some of these specific bits. We had a camera set up to point right down at the, at the desk, but that's not going to work now. I thought I was just spending the last uh, 10 or so minutes trying to work out, but it wanted to disconnect as soon as I hooked my Ethernet up directly. So apparently uh, it jumped off to the IP network over Wi-Fi. I just wasn't loving the uh, camera. Anyway, first and foremost, thank you guys for uh, joining me here today, right? Uh, I really like, you know, doing these and hanging out with everybody. It's five o'clock somewhere. We'll borrow a line. Yeah. I did also uh, change the video quality from, from like high def from 1080p down to 720. So that hopefully we won't have any latency. Uh, A-OK -okay on the audio and video. Okay, so that, that's pretty That's pretty good. So just jumping into um, the bits that I have here in front of me with easel. I've got, a, I've got a handful of bits here on the table. You guys can't all see them, but you can't see them all. But um, we'll go over a bunch of these bits, even a roundover bit um, as well. So I mean, really, I want to talk really about... Uh, the two V bits here first, right? I'm not sure if we can see them. We might have to play with the focus there, but we got two V bits. One little one here that's an uh, eighth inch diameter bit, and then the Amana RC45711. If you know me, then you know that's my favorite uh, V bit for the last like year or so. Um, and the interesting part about entering these over in easel oh can you see that those two bits yeah so we'll jump back real quick to the other one and uh so an interesting part about entering those over in easel is that they um they both have a 90 degree angle but they have different widths which Ironically enough, the way the easel set up, that affects the uh, the step over automatically. And I don't really love the way it's set up that way, but but that is the way it's set up to uh, to run. And let's turn that off real quick. All right. When the IP camera cut off, I was going to cheat and try and use uh, my other cell phone as as a secondary camera to get the overhead view of this. But I will just do it holding it in front of me this way instead. So over here in easel, we can select add bits. And obviously, we don't want an inevitables bit. We want a custom one. We're just going to name the bit. So for this one here, we're going to do the... Um, the smaller one, right? The eighth inch. So the eighth inch wide one over here, right? And for our bit type, if you're not aware of this already, the ball nose only works with the uh, 3D finishing tool path. Although it's kind of interesting that you can enter it here and no nowhere does it actually tell you that. But when you try and use it, it, it won't appear anywhere other than the uh, 3D finishing um, bit selection. So that's not the right one. And these other ones of compression, down cut, straight or up cut, we'll get into those later. But 
they also don't actually affect the toolpath at all. They're all four end mills. So they, they create the same toolpath no matter which one you pick. So as you pick these, it's more for your own convenience of being able to tell your bits apart. Because if you have um, the same bits of different styles like these, different uh, subgenre of an end mill, basically, right? Um, you might want to save different cut settings. And this would allow you to have like an, a quarter inch upcut might have a slightly different cut setting than your quarter inch compressing down or straight cuts, right? So that would allow you to save them as that. Although your naming structure um, for this name above could also accommodate what these four different types do. Uh, however, since Easel did create their own bits of thrown bit directory, that's kind of where these came from. They use these to help differentiate their own. So here for both of these, we're gonna select a V bit. And for this one here, uh, we've got an inch mode right now. Actually, I believe all the bits had to be entered in inches, right? So even though it's uh, eighth inch or 3.17 by millimeters, we have to put in the cutting diameter of this bit um, as impure, right? Which is one eighth inch or 0.125. And then the angle here is a 90. So we're gonna enter it as that. Right, and then we've got that bit that just saved right now, which is right here. 93.175 millimeter. Let's see if this is open right now. It is not. But oh, we don't want Windows 11. <laughs> here, let me let me pull up one more thing here. I got another trick up my sleeve today. Maybe. Can't find it. I was testing some apps the other day that allow me to do a few extra things on here. So hopefully it'll work. Once that loads up, it should be good. All right. So when we go to this bit as well, we can um, check out what the settings are here by clicking edit and potentially make changes to it. So if you enter the wrong angle, if you're into the wrong cutting diameter for one of your bits, or if you just want to, like, let's say you no longer have a certain bit, you could just reconfigure it um, rather than deleting it and, and saving a new one. And the other thing is, as you save machine profiles, um, and, and different cut settings, they get assigned. So your cut settings for your different bits get assigned to your different machine profiles, right? So when you test a ton out like I do and you forget to delete them all, um, they all just kind of populate in here. And I, do, I don't usually save custom set, cut settings in, in Easel. I tend to just type them in under manual cut settings every time because I use kind of the roundabout similar cut settings for, for different bits anyway. Um, but here we've got, again, that, that smaller bit, right? And because the cutting diameter is 0.125, when we uh, replicate this, which... Um, actually, I think I've got the Amana RC45711 already entered in here somewhere. Yeah, right there. You'll see it's the same 90 degree, but our cutting diameter is 0.688 which is 11, I believe that's 11 sixteenths of an inch. Right, does that sound about right? Let's check. Oh, I rounded up, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's 11 sixteenths of an inch. And um, that's how wide this bit is. So those two are entered. And if we come over here to select one, the ironic part about these bits, right? Since it's using that um, that diameter, here, we're going to type that out real fast, real quick. We um, 
So we've got two different widths here for the V bits, right? 0.688 inches and uh, 0.125 inches. And when we come over here to do the carve, depending on which one we select, it's going to make a difference, especially if we take this and uh, reduce the depth. Even though our step downs are going to be set the same here once I go through and do this, 0 0.028, 9, and 30, okay? So we're just going to replicate that same thing for these two different carves and look at the time difference that the two bits take. Now, it's really only going to be a different time because I set it to be a flat depth here at the bottom. And the bit width is actually used to calculate the step over. And since these two bits use a different width, they're going to have a different step over amount, which I think is a really weird way to do it. Um, I don't really know why Easel's got it set that way, other than it was easy for them to implement um, that method. But why would these two have a different step over? Maybe a different step down, I understand. But there's no reason why a 90 degree V bit would have a different step over than, a different, than the one next to it, right? Um, especially for making the flat bottom pockets. So, and what it pulls for that step over is over here under machine and general settings. Let's see if I can do this. Control one. Oh, there we go. We've got um, the V bit detail step over is 1% by default. And the step over, which is actually used for end mills, and the V bit step downs until it reaches the very bottom of a flat bottom pocket, it's going to use this 40% as well. At the bottom of a flat bottom pocket, the V bit step detail step over comes into play only. So it's going to take that 0.688 times 1% for this bit, and it's going to take the 0.125 times 1% for that bit. So this bit step over is going to be almost six times as far as this one, even though they have the exact same angle, which I don't think makes sense. Um, here, we'll escape out of there real quick. <clears throat> uh, so oftentimes I find myself changing this higher, but ultimately another fix would be to, to tell it that the bit is wider than it really is um, in order to get that, that step over effect. So here we've got the Amana bit selected. I'm going to make sure that we duplicate these settings over for the next one as well, 39 and 0 0.028. But we'll simulate this out and look at how long it takes to um, carve this. All right, so now it's showing 16 minutes. So if I go and I select the other new one that we just made. This is the new one, 90 degree 3.75 or 0.125, right? 39 and 0 0.028. So all of our settings here are still the same. So we're at 16 minutes for this bit with a different width. All the other settings are now the same. And we just jumped to 43 minutes. But the step down is the same. The only thing that changed is because of the width, it's now using a larger step over. But the step over is so microscopic, it doesn't make a difference. You know what I'm saying? So um, for that reason, that and that that is why I think the way that Easel handles V bits is highly flawed. Um, and and the step over here should not use a percentage. Um, but should use a numerical value. They can baseline it off a percentage, but give the user the ability to enter numerical values maybe into their bit settings. So if it were me, I would change the little one up to a higher percentage step over so that it equals just about the same as the large one. Because uh, you can see how microscopic the step overs are down in here, right? And when I change it to the, the RC, RC45711, they're going to get bigger. For really no apparent reason because the bits are going to carve the same the step over is so tiny it's not going to make a difference on these bits um, so so yeah it's not really by changing bits that we're able to go 16 uh in, in minutes versus 43 minutes it is the step over alone because our depth per pass was still the same for both and that's the part that I would normally change based on the bit size was the depth per pass. Anyway, so now I've gone into V-bits way too much. And you can kind of see how the way that Easel handles them doesn't make very much sense. 
So I do have a tapered ball bit here. Uh, let's see if I have to. I might not have the packaging for that one. So I think it's labeled actually because it's a B tools bit. Oh yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and switch this over to Oh, there we go. Oh, maybe we're still too close. Oh, no. We're never going to. Oh, there we go. We can focus on it. We can focus on it. So it looks like we're at radius 0.5. Diameter is uh, a quarter inch. So really all that we need from this is the radius of this tip, which is a 0.5 millimeter radius tipped bit. All right, so we jump back over here into easel real quick. When we enter this bit, the tapered ball bit in my hand, we can't account for the taper, which is another, I'm, I guess I'm going to list all the flaws of entering bits in easel. Um, another flaw of of the um, the way that easel currently handles ball bits. Now, I've heard through the grapevine that um, they're working on that. It does take a considerable about considerable amount of um, work to the way the tool paths are generated, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label this by what it says on the bit. Uh, what's the other spec here? Seventy six point two length and two flute. So this really is a point five radius taper ball bit. Right. So over here for bit type, we've got a select ball nose. Now you could enter this as an end mill using the diameter alone if you're going to like surface engrave stuff. But as you start to go deeper, that taper is going to cause it to uh, kind of blow out the carve and make it uh, remove more material than it's supposed to. Now it can do the same thing when you are carving 3D as well. It could potentially blow out the carve if uh, because it can't account for that taper if you have straight vertical walls, right? Um, yeah, so we're going to select ball nose, and the cutting diameter is, so it's a 0.5 radius, but we need the cutting diameter. So we'll do 0.5 times 2 gives us diameter, divided by 25.4 is our conversion from metric uh, millimeters to inches, and we've got 0 0.03937, so 0 0.0394. And that's now entered here under our uh, ball bits. This one here on top. It looks like we're rounding to uh, three decimal places anyway, right? All right. So then we go over here and we uh, upload an STL file. Or actually, we can just open another one, right? I think I've already got another one over here opened up. Let's go with something somewhat simple. That one should be fine, actually. Now, the issue with this bit is even though it's a one millimeter diameter and a radius of 0.5, right? It's uh, still going to take a lot of time to carve. 
And that is, I'm going to drop a link to this in um, the chat as well. Yeah, this is a great uh, resource for the step over here of um, used for uh, 3D carbs. So there I went ahead and dropped that one in the chat. Let's see if the overlay works today. There we go. Hopefully that pops up on the screen in a second. But we've got this uh, US Army veteran one that somebody sent me to help them with a while ago. And we can select um, the different bits here. So here's the ball nose bit that I just created under custom here, 0 0.039 inches. And that's all we really do for that. Now, the thing is, like I mentioned about using a uh, tapered ball bit when you've got straight vertical walls, it's going to, uh, let me see if I can find a good angle here. So areas like this wall, where the wall here is um, a straight vertical, right? As the bit, it, it thinks it's a ball bit, so it's going to go like straight down like this as if it's a ball. But in fact, it knows our diameter, this part here. Oh, let's see if I can do this. Control B. There we go. It knows our diameter, but it doesn't know um, the fact that there's actually a slight taper to it. So, and I exaggerated the taper here quite a bit, right? But it's going to carve that much extra right once it hits the wall once it hit in order for it to uh, reach the bottom so because of that these super tall vertical walls like that it's going to over carve some of the stuff when you use a ball bit like this so that's just something to keep in mind i probably would stay away from the tapered ball bit on these or if you do use it get one with an extremely uh light taper to it that's almost straight vertical and I don't think i have any ball bit sitting here. This one here is a bull nose bit, so it's got a radius to it, but it comes to a slight flat on top. And there's not really a great way to enter those in the easel because it's not, it's it's kind of a, a combination between ball and, um, and an end mill. Um, if you guys have any questions too, just let me know and, and we'll address them, all right? Um, so, Obviously, the next one, I mean, you guys know how to enter end mills. Those are relatively simple. We'll, we'll, we'll jump in here and enter one anyway. Um, but I've got this one in front of me, which is uh, a quarter inch single flute up cut. Great for cutting uh, plastics. We're gonna call this uh, one flute upcut quarter inch, right? So for our bit type, like I said, it doesn't matter if I select upcut, straight cut, down cut, or compression. It's it's gonna create the same exact toolpath for all of them, although it is gonna make a different picture uh, appear, which could help you identify the bits if you're not sure which one's an upcut or a down cut, right? Oh, actually, you know, I got ahead of myself. I mentioned that I dropped in the chat a, a, a link to a website that talks about um, step overs and 3D carving, right? And here's that page. Let's just go over that real quick, and then we'll go back over into that end mill that I started entering. But this um, kind of explanation over on CNC Cookbook is a great one that explains how step overs work, especially for 3D carving. And about how using a smaller uh, sized diameter tip of the bit versus a a, um, a smaller step over 
has a kind of a similar but slightly different effect on the car and about how sometimes you go so small on the step over and so small on the tip of the bit that you end up spending so much time that it really is a um you might be wasting more time than you're really gaining in detail it also kind of depends on whether or not your model actually has that much detail as well right so um looks like not all these pictures want to populate right now but there's uh there are some some great explanation there about how step over being one tenth of the diameter of the bit right here leaves you these little tiny what's called scallops and if you go double that to one fifth the scallops gets get much larger and more you know easy to identify and when you when you cut that down again a little bit more to one third they become even larger right now depending on what size bit you're using because this one is still the one that I entered just now is really small still at, at, at a one millimeter diameter uh, or 0.5 millimeter radius. So these scallops are still going to be pretty small, but they could be noticeable on if it's a third of the diameter, right? So that would be 33% over in easel. So if we jump back over to easel to that project, that would be over here under cut settings. So if we change this to 33%, that's when you would... Um, see this larger scalloping right and then as you go down one fifth is 20 percent, and then one tenth is 10 percent, and how it's almost not noticeable which is why the uh, default in easel is well i want to say it's 10 but it might be 12 um percent as a step over because it's it's just there at not quite exercise the utility of going too small on the step over but still small enough that you don't really see you know, it's hard to see the lines of the step over unless you're using a much larger diameter bit, in which case those are, um, you know, exaggerated quite a bit. Did I just close that window? Okay. So if you want to check, read that whole write up, it's over there in the, um, the, there's a link to it over in the chat. All right. And if it's still on the screen, hopefully it's not. Anyway, I'll keep going because there's a delay between me taking off the screen and it actually moving off the screen. So, end mill, right? The next we're going to do is end mill. And I had already entered it as this one flute upcut quarter inch. You see, if we change this from up cut to uh, down cut and save it, it changes the the twist that it's showing on here. So you can use that to help identify which bit is which, looking at these pictures. And, and that's really the only reason why, um, why they have these pictures here. And here you can see the compression bit. It uses a twist of one direction at the tip, and then it twists back the other direction for the rest of the bit. And I don't think that have a compression over here I don't um, to show you but that's how they work compressors are really great when cutting through plywood if your machine can take those additional forces because it has to cut into the um, the down cut portion over here for it to really have the effect of a compression bit to help prevent especially breaking the top veneer of the plywood and getting too much chip out but anyway this is an upcut bit quarter inch single flu which is, like, like I said, great for cutting uh, plastics and some aluminum. It, it's going to do okay with that. I would stick to cutting plastics with it. And um, maybe wood that I'm going to round over the edge that I'm not too worried about a chipped up um, edge surface from it, right? That I'm going to put a round over on it on the router table afterwards. Or... Uh, or even on the CNC, we'll get into, I have a round over bit I'm going to enter. It takes a little bit of tricking easel to get it to work right, but you can use a round over bit even with an easel. Um, anyway, we'll jump over here real quick. And obviously once you go to use these bits, it's going to have some, some really conservative defaults once you try and put in your own custom bits. And then uh, once you carve with it, 
by setting your own manual settings. At the end of the card, you get a pop up that says, were those settings good? Do you want to save them? Yes or no. And if you say yes, those settings that you use on that car get saved as your new automatic settings for that bit. And that's what shows up under these cut settings here. And these are all machines that I've deleted. I have a couple of different um, easel accounts. So these ones here are machines that I've deleted out that probably should be reassigned so I can actually use these bits. Um, but yeah, that this is where those custom settings get, get saved to. So if you do have to redo your machine setup, um, like if you had to install the new driver and it forces you to redo the machine setup for something like that, you could go in here and uh, reassign which machine these bits are assigned to, right? Like I can now set this to the Carvey and save it. And um, oh, I should probably leave that one the way it is. Change this one to, you know, 3018 to master or the lead, which my CNC isn't exactly a lead, but it's really close to the specs of the 1515, right? And then there's this whole tutorial that it takes to about how to, from, it's actually for about, I want to say 2015, 2016 when this was released. Um, but it tells you how to kind of help calculate that sort of stuff. Now, the problem is a lot of people rely on those calculators to set their cut settings. And um, if you try that and you have a lower power machine, you're going to have a lot of chatter and the cut's not going to come out that well. So I actually suggest kind of starting with the defaults that it gives you and uh, for your machine type, or if, if, if you've talked in, in one of the the different CNC groups, what other people recommend to use on your specific model CNC as a baseline. And then um, you can go in there and cut with it, look at your chips and whether or not the machine does have chatter. If the machine, if the machine has chatter, then you're either going to want to reduce your cut settings and or figure out what rigidity issue you're having with the machine itself to address the chatter of the machine. And usually it's a combination of those two things early on in the stages anyway. If you've got a machine for a while that's been running fine and you're using the same cut settings and you're starting to develop chatter, it's probably because something got loose, like eccentric nuts on the V wheels or a belt on a belt driven machine or the anti backlash device on like a lead screw machine. Uh, other loose hardware, right, that, that mounts uh, the different axes together. Anyway, we can jump out of this. We did enough of the V bit. We did a tapered ball, and the ball is going to be the same thing. You're just using the tip diameter. Now I do kind of want to jump in there real quick and, and show kind of one thing where I think the way that ESOL set up is also confusing, right? Because here we've got angle and width, but when we went ahead and set up the, uh, the bit in the toolbox for that ball bit, or sorry, for the V bit, we had um, angle and cutting diameter. And I know it. I know that width means cutting diameter, but that I mean that's really confusing to some people, right? Because it's it's it even cutting diameter isn't totally clear that that they're talking about the widest part of the bit and not the tip. Because some V bits come with a spec for the flat tip, and easel really isn't configured to use flat tip V bits. And sometimes, uh, if the flat tip part is too wide, it can really screw up um, easel. So. Let's jump back over here to the toolbox and we'll enter in this uh, round over bit. It's the Amana 56125. We'll slide that out of the packaging here. And I'll pull that up so you can see what it kind of looks like as well. That way I don't have to try and zoom in on the bit itself on the camera again, right? So the Amana 56125 is this round over bit. So it, this one's really small, um, but you can use larger ones as well, right? Here we'll control one here. And here you can see it's going to, you can use it to make these almost like half of a dowel, or you can use it around the outside. Um, so if this was all square and you just did the outside, 
you would just end up with, you know, this portion here, right? Just the round over sitting on the outside. As if, as if this portion here didn't exist, right? Don't you like that coloring job? Um, so that, what we really need here in order to enter it in easel is the D1 value. Right? Um, so we will escape out of here. We need the D1 value, which is 0 0.02 inches. And the D1 value is essentially the width of the tip here. So see how there's a flat tip to it? Because it has to have a flat tip in order to be somewhat strong. None of them actually come to a true, um, well, I, I say none of them, but uh, I have not found any that come to a true point on the tip, right? If they did, then you could enter uh, a, a really tiny number in easel and get away with that. But in this case, this number is still pretty small at 0 0.02 inches, but that's what we're going to enter here, right? And uh, so we'll jump over here into easel. We're going to add this bit. Yeah, so we're going to select add bits and then custom our bit name. 56125. One uh, eighth inch round over is the radius. Eighth inch is the radius of the round over, right? So we'll put that in there. And our bit type. Like I said, we have to enter it as an end mill in order to kind of trick easel to use it. So it doesn't really matter which end mill style here we pick. We're just going to pick a straight cut because it, um, well, it does definitely doesn't have the spiral of any of the other rest of them, right? So then for the cutting diameter, we had, uh, what was that? That um, D1 value was 0 0.02 inches. And... We actually only need to enter half of that uh, because of the way that the bit rides along the contour of the edge there. We'll enter half of that and click save. Let me see if I can, sorry, I'm trying to do two different screens here at the same time. Uh, and then that's all we do for the round over bit. It's pretty much entered, right? When we go to use it though, when you go to use this round over bit, let's say, we can carve the middle here using a um, the text using the V bits that we talked about. And then we want to come around the outside and, and, and cut out this perimeter using an end mill. We're going to cut outside shape using an end mill first. Um, so let's say we use the V bit to carve this in. We can then delete our design, come back over here with an end mill set to outside the path. And really any size end mill will work, but we'll use that uh, quarter inch one that we just entered. Did I enter that one wrong? Because uh, it says eighth inch there. Anyway, we'll use an eighth inch bit. And um, we can add tabs here if we go full depth. And then once we carve that with the eighth inch bit, We'll then have to come back with our new round over that I entered, right? And as long as we leave that set to outside shape path, then they're going to be in the same exact position, right? The The edge of this tip is going to be right along the edge of where the end mill went. We will have to set this depth, though, right? Because the bit is only... Let's jump back over here real quick. The, the depth we want to go is this deep right which is the round over radius so which is eighth of an inch so when we use this bit we just have to be cognizant that we can only go eighth of an inch or else it's going to leave a weird lip on top which you might like the little um lip that it creates by doing that it kind of gives you uh like a like a ogi style bit I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, but yeah.
five, six, one, two, five. And I'm going to put a link to this bit in the chat as well if you guys want to look at it or potentially buy a round over to try. It's This one is, like I said, it's only like 25 bucks on Amazon for, for that round over. It, it is pretty small, though. So you might want to get the next size larger, uh, depending on what you're carving into. Now, I was using it um, for some, like, catch-all trays that actually had some really tight spots. And that was, like, the smallest round over I could find. Um... So that's what I went with there. So by setting it to 0.125, it's only going to go 0.125 deep. It's going to ride along this line here, and it is going to give us a round over going into the inside right there. You can see I'm going to keep the, the screen where it's at, and you can kind of see that we're going to end up with how can I do this to make sense? So the line here, the left side of the line is where the the left side of that center flat part of the tip is going to ride along. Uh, it's actually, the, the tip is going to be in that groove, right? Versus the eighth inch bit, which the left side of it would have been right here, and the right side would be wider. So it, it cuts along this, and then it radiuses up and in that little bit with the radius bit. Now, again, you might not need this small of a radius, um, depending on what the design is, like this one here, just, just carving a square. Uh, you, it might be easier to do on a roundover table, but or on a router table using a roundover bearing bit. But if you do a different design that has like crevices in it, like a heart shape or a star or something like that, right? Uh, I was doing a, like, a, it was dog paws for the trays I had. So the top of the like paw here, if I can, we'll we'll use we'll use this one for example. Oh, now we're already getting into the apps, right? Even though we're an hour in, oops. And you end up with this here. Control J, cut outside of path you end up with stuff like this where it comes into a nice little corner in these different spots and going in there with a bearing um, style round over bit uh, you you won't be able to get in there right the, the bearing is going to stop you from getting into some of these corners uh, yeah well I'm just going to keep on going right Craig <laughs> um, off, in, off in space on some of these tangents but We've covered all the bits I want to cover. I guess we can get into the different apps that I use. But yeah, using using the actual CNC roundover bit, you don't have that um, that ball bearing to deal with. Let's see. There's routers up on that shelf. Is there one with the the ball? Oh, the ball bit one is probably in my router table down there. Oh well. And I'm not going to pull it out right now, but maybe one day I'll show you guys how I made that router table. It's pretty, pretty basic and simple, but um, yeah. Kevin, I don't actually work with Inventables. Um, they don't compensate me for anything. I'm trying to get them to, but we'll see. We'll see how it works. I do my own thing. I, and, and realistically, like I started out this video, if I did, would I be able to say some of the stuff that I do that's negative about about their products, right? I'm just being real with you guys. I do work with some other brands, and I they know that they get the same sort of treatment. If they if they have products that aren't that aren't performing, I'm I'm going to point it out. Um, because everybody deserves to have that truth in in information, right? Anyway, so I'm going to jump back over here. And um, we will. Well, I've Kevin, I've 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 uh, talked to them about it. I've given them some opportunities to to really like an affiliate thing, just for referring people to the software uh, and and their products. But there's there's pros and cons to to some of the stuff they sell. So, I mean, other than you know working with trying to do my own tutorials to uh, 
So I, I guess we're, we're building a community here again, right? We'll, we'll see what this YouTube channel becomes over the next year if I keep up doing these, uh, these weekly live streams and still trying to get a video out every now and then. I have a couple machines to assemble over there and then the silverback review to finish up as well. You know, there's actually a 3D printer in a box back there as well that we might be putting together. Um, there's two 3D printers that are running right now. But anyway, th there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and delete this out. Actually, we'll undo back to where we were. Let's use this pod to kind of talk about the different um, apps that I kind of prefer using. So I'm going to go ahead and combine these because you notice they're different single individual parts. We're going to go ahead and combine. And drop it over there. So over here under this Lego button, we have the apps. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you hover over these things, we get a pop-up of an explanation of what they mean, right? Um, I think it's kind of interesting that they give you an import 3D STL file button, and then it's again right here, right? And of course, it's again over here. Anyway, really, really promoting that function. If we go over here to the apps, which is what I wanted to show you, um, well, actually, where we get this pop print from, right? We selected the Pro Design Library. Sorry about that. I just hit the watch my watch against the uh, mic. But under the Pro Design Library, you see all these all these different designs, right? Now I don't. I have to go search for it, but Inventables did put out a publication that identified uh, late in. 2020 that um, they released users to use these commercially for your own purposes um, so you you could make a copy of that I, I suggest that you get it in writing and print it out and, and save it as well just in case but um, just I'm sure they're not going to come after you but uh, as a means of CYA right um, but they they did say that in a, in a in a public, I want to say it was a video actually on their on their uh, channel where they talked about the Pro Design Library and, and people asking to be able to use them for um, commercially, right? So, with that being said, I guess I guess you could run with that and use these for your products on stuff without having to pay for or, or find open source um, uh, designs anyway so i'm going to go ahead and take this one and we're going to go over here to the apps and you can see in here that there's we got categories i usually just don't even bother with the categories there's not that many apps to scroll through anyway and they still are categorized in what they kind of do so i use the combine function just now to to uh get these together let's bring in one more too i'm going to go ahead and bring in a word as well because that's going to show this off pretty well pretty clearly All right. So I'm going to combine these two together. That way, this works a little better. Apps. And my most used apps are really the offsetter, which is actually, I don't love this original one. The original offsetter only works in inches. And it um, you'll see here. We'll, we'll use it once real quick. And it moves a copy of your design down here to the bottom left so it's no longer centered where it was a moment ago whereas if we take that same thing and we go over here to a different offsetter so that was this first one there's another one that says offsetter v2 a little bit below it so the first one here offsetter and then offsetter v2 right there right so we can actually go up here and just type in the word off you don't have to finish typing in the whole thing you could even probably just type OF and you get a lot less stuff, right? So OFF and you get the two offsetters. If we select offsetter V2, one, you get the ability to, if you have this toggled over to millimeters, then this value is then millimeters instead of, um, of inches, right? And we can import. So see, it kind of does some different stuff here with it. But what I like to do is copy this. I just press control C to copy it, come over here to that offsetter V2, and we'll make our, um, 
we don't need to keep original, we can just get rid of it. Import that one, and then we combine these to do like the perimeter path of cutting out that paw, which obviously I didn't do enough of an offset there. I should have paid more attention to that screen before I did that. And then if we paste this one over here like that, oops, edit. And we can do something like that to get them back realigned. And you can see that um, the original offsetter justified all of our design here to the lower left. And the second offsetter kept our new offset directly around where the design was. Uh, it didn't move it around. You could still use the original one as well and just have to realign stuff afterwards, kind of like how I realign these afterwards. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete out that and we'll jump back, oops. F11. Um, we'll jump back over here and I'll show you another app that I use all the time, right? So in here, I have used uh, this box maker classic to make some polymetric workout boxes uh, and they sold pretty well. So, or sorry, the plyometric ply, plyo boxes they're called like for jumping and stepping on top of and whatnot. Um, and since you can enter three different diameters, I made them so that they are three different heights, depending on how you rotate them. Uh, and I'll do a whole project on that uh, one day. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, I, I set up a button over here that I can press that announces that you did that. And it's not, it's not going to work now. <laughs> um, thanks, man. Um, but we are paying for them with the subscription. You're paying for what? Invenable. Oh, with the subscription to my, to, to, to my channel. Yeah. You're, you're essentially, uh, paying for for me to make these videos i guess um but it, we'll see we'll see if it, if it becomes a full-time job eventually um but anyway come over here and the other two that i like to use are to separate it out because now i've got these two designs that are all combined right i've got to get these parts separate now because they're not uh, i want to move the word text over to the center and it's it's not centered above this so i'm gonna come back over here and i want to there's two different apps that kind of do similar stuff. This Exploder with the letter X in the front and the Shape Exploder, right? I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna try both of them to see the results. And I'm not gonna change the gap, I'm just gonna leave it the way it is and select Import. And you'll see I've now got um, all of these letters are, the parts that are touching are combined, but the parts that are we're not touching at all, like the top of the T and the bottom of the T, Every piece like that is now independent of itself, right? Of each other. Um, and that's what that shape exploder does, right? If we come over here with exploder, we... I'm sorry, that was the, that was the first one. That was exploder. So we go over here with shape exploder. We can select that one and then import. And that one actually replaces our original. And it does some weird stuff. Here, I'm going to show you that with the word text here. So the X, the Exploder one does this one over here that's that's black. It changes the depth to full depth automatically as well. The Shape Exploder does this thing where it even pops out centers of letters and makes them their own, their own depth, um, which could get confusing when you go to do stuff. So once you do that, if you do use Shape Exploder, you might want to then combine back. Because if you don't combine and you accidentally move that, independent of that, the E hole, good luck getting it back in there. Um, and also if you have a huge design and you use this, uh, it's it could cause problems. Here, we'll go ahead and open a new project. Where is a good one? Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's go with that. We'll use the Eagle Globe and Anchor from the Marine Corps logo for this, for this example. It's hard to see on this uh, checkered background sometimes what this is about to do. So I'm actually going to move it up over the blue. Because if it does create the white different areas, it's going to look kind of funky over the uh, white background. So we've got the Shape Exploder, the grenade one, that we're going to pick here. And it's going to take a minute because it's got a lot more vectors here to uh, deal with because of all those inside ones that it's got to create into um, their own thing. Here you can already see that it's going to screw it up, right? That we've got parts of here that they, they don't look right. But very many times you will need to do this and then go through and select things like this and then set it to zero depth. And I like to select that main border and just adjust it ever so slightly. And that helps us. If you've got one big piece like that, that then helps us to select this one. And I go up here to edit, select by matching depth. And now I've just kind of gone ahead and fixed all that. Oh, looks like when I did that, there was a bit more that I was missing, right? The simple buy up here, we got to change those too, because that needs to carve inward. All right. So in this um, logo, if you get the one that I am using here uh, off of uh, Wikipedia, when you import it, it does come with all these different white pieces. And they are, I believe it does import them with this like weird variant color like you see it here. Um, so knowing that you can do this and select by matching depth like this, and then set these all to zero. Basically, I'm going to put this back right how it was right now. And we end up with the one solid shape that it was uh, before I did the shape exploder. And, and a lot of times, that's really what, what you might have to do with a logo that you pay somebody for. You buy off of Etsy. You, you, you pay somebody to design it for you. A lot of times, when you import it, it will do weird stuff like that. We'll go ahead and wait and see if this filters out. Um, Hey, did you just purchase a membership? That's pretty neat. Look at you guys. Um, I'm learning stuff too now. I didn't realize I was going to cut off part of the words there either. Oh, I guess you're paying for them with a subscription um, because you get the pro ones. There's not a... Um, so yeah, I guess this question here, you're paying for them with the subscription. The the pro design library that I was that I was talking about, right? And how you have access to use those commercially according to what they said. Um, I guess you are. It's not discreetly written into the terms at all. Um, their, their terms are very vague and they they really just uh, out them from any liability for, for causing damages to your stuff or, or you suing them at all. It doesn't really talk about having the rights to any of these things. But in that video, um, I want to say it was a video. It might have been a, like a blog, like a FAQ type of blog post to their website as well with the video where they talk about um, making all these available for users of ESOL to use commercially. And of course, when you pay for Pro, you get access to Pro, although you do get it with a free account too for the first 30 days. So that's kind of um, questionable whether or not you can use them after that period if you're not paying for it. But you want to know what the most profitable product. So, yeah, let me jump through real fast and make sure that I cover all these things. Um, I have to show you some pictures of the, of the of the bio workout boxes. They weren't highly profitable, but they were extremely easy to make. Um, and if you've got a local gym or or some some uh, yeah local gyms around you or people making home gyms, the person who bought them for me bought um, eight of them. And she was transitioning from being a personal trainer at a gym to doing a home gym type of deal because COVID hit. So I made her those uh, and then also made some stencils to spray paint 
their logo on them and what the different dimensions were for each side. Uh, I created that stencil in easel and then just used a piece of uh, MDF as a stencil and just, you know, a, a larger piece of MDF as a stencil and held it on there and spray painted this stuff in using the stencil type font and then mirroring it that way I had the right, um, uh, that way the tabs were away from the back. Anyway, we can go into that later about how I did that. But um, yeah, those really are my favorite ones so far. These other ones called the Bezier Cone, Slope, and the Super Gradient Generator are neat for getting like a, a, a near 3D effect in the 2.5D um, workspace. So if we, let's go back to this one real quick here. And I'm just going to select that part of the paw for this. And we'll delete the rest of this out to make sure it doesn't take too long. Oops. Pushing the right button helps again. Um, so like that part of the paw, and we'll go over here to the apps and choose the super gradient generator. And you'll kind of see how this works to make a sloped or bowl effect to the bottom of the paw. Now we can get into what exactly all these things do. There's a forum post here that talks about it. And it looks like they also have a YouTube video that talks about it from a long time ago. Um, the settings might even be different now than they were back then. I think they're d slightly different now than they were in the YouTube video, but they updated the forum post. Um, but you can select what kind of curve you want, easing in or easing out. I want to say we use ease in for this. And um, you can kind of change your custom curve here as well. We've got a start depth of zero and an end depth of, we'll go a little bit less than a quarter inch. And the more steps you use, the more kind of radius it uh, it becomes. Um, it, or the, the more steps you use, the less sanding you'll have to do on the inside of this, right? It will take more time because every step is a step down that it's going to have to carve. So it's going to take a little bit more time. But it does use a smarter step-down approach for this. Um, so it's not too bad. And then uh, some of these numbers here, right? I, I can slide these up to 100 steps. You can type whatever you want in here. So it'll it'll um, allow whatever you actually type in here as the, uh, the step count, right? Even if it's beyond what the slider wants. Yeah, you can use this app to make the catch-all tray, yes. Um, it does get a little bit tricky to, you know, get stuff like this right. So we've got this gradient percentage, and that's kind of going to allow us to get our flat part down here and then just have the step-downs in this outside part. So I'm going to drop this down to mm, 58. There we go. And when I import this, we'll simulate. The, I probably didn't even have to simulate. We could have just ran the detail view. But that's okay. Yeah, so it's going to take a second to simulate because... Um, all those steps take some time. So if you do, if you are using like multiple pockets here, like all these different um, toes of the paw, you might want to put them on their own different uh, different toolpath. And I might even just, there we go, it's simulating now. Of course, as I'm doing this, I'm using a ton of this computer's processing speed and RAM to run the live stream too. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. Over here with the three dots. If you don't know about this, the little uh, hamburger emblem over here with the three dots, we can we have a handful of tools over here which are kind of neat. Um, but we're going to uncheck tool pass so we can get down in there and look at it. And here you can see how I chose ease in and I meant to choose ease out, which would have done it this way a little bit. Um, in there. So that's just something to be aware of is those options of whether it was linear or ease in or ease out or ease out in the, the different options for that are going to control what this does. And again, with that, that curve, 
you can figure out what numbers you want to use for your curve and just type them in as well. And that would um, give you some different values to work with in there. Uh, we'll, we'll go through this one more time. Is it that one? Uh, no. Here, well, I'm going to leave everything else the way it is. You, you can kind of see that the best way to do this is to kind of just play around with these settings and see what they end up with. Oh, I didn't. I didn't do a good job of setting the um, the center down. Unfortunately, every time you go out and go back into it, you do all all the settings that you changed are now reset to those defaults, right? So we can go with. Uh, custom we can type in some different numbers here and we're going to end up with a whole different style right what's going on here now you do get uh warnings when it's gonna yell at you about stuff right And again, our ending depth, we don't want to call it all the way through the bottom. So we'll go with that one, I think. I need a different... Um... So we want it to be really white and slowly fade into that, right? I usually model these in Fusion 360, to be honest with you. But as far as the bottoms here, or use a uh, a, a bowl bit. But uh, by using this step over one, you can get uh, some interesting 3D-ish effects, right? And here I've, I've left the steps at their default of 20, and you can clearly see them there. But if you set this to like 100, 150, depending on how far you're going down, the steps become almost uh, invisible. And then one light hit with some sandpaper, and uh, they're good to go. Again, that app takes some getting used to, and I don't use it a lot, but it is a very useful app. This inlay generator is another one that um, I've used in the past to do um, to do puzzles, actually. If I take this design how it is now, and I check uncut areas right here, it's gonna highlight in red where the bit can't get into. But if I was to make like an inlay with this, and as I've seen people do in the past, you make a copy of it, and then you could cut outside the shape here. And you can see how this outside of the shape, which is going to be the male plug to fit into the inlay, is never going to fit. Because there's areas where this end mill couldn't have gone. Uh, and that becomes a problem. But if we take that, and even if we make it larger, so the end mill could fit in there. You still have these uh, radiuses where the end mill can't fit in the X and the E and stuff, right? But up here, it could. We've got a sharp corner. We, we, we've got sharper corners in these areas, right? Maybe this isn't the best font to choose for this, but we'll pick another one real fast. One that comes to sharp corners here. There we go. So you can see the sharp corners of this T, but these are radius because the bit can't get in there, right? Because you've got a round bit carving these things. Whereas over here, we do have a sharp corner, but in here we don't. So you'll have gaps of, of where um, the plug, the male part, isn't going to fit in, and you'll have other gaps in the, in the opposite of where the male part is too big to fit in. So if we take this, text and we run it through the inlay generator first this is how i made the children's puzzles that fit together um, snugly but not tight um, so the kids can actually put the pieces in and out by hand so we just enter our bit size here of eighth of an inch and you might have to tweak the tolerance on how your machine handles stuff but we'll import that and what we end up with is 
These two are our new ones. So I'm just going to move these old ones out of the way. And you can see that with the uncut areas check down here, once we run the detail view, it'll show for us that, um, oh, because of the proximity of those ones, we do have a little issue there where the bit can't get into it still. Um, but if it wasn't for those two almost touching in a weird manner, that'd be good. Um, so yeah, that's something to keep keep in mind when you do this. Usually, like I said, I do I do discrete letters for the name signs for these kids so that the, they're separated out a little bit more. But you can see here how it's nearly perfect. There's no red spots except for that one right there where those two letters were just too close um, versus all the different red spots that were around these ones. All right. So... Uh, yeah, that covers those fairly well. I think that's all the apps I was going to show you. Let me make sure on that list. There's another video where I show how I made um, some different kind of puzzles that were, I want to say the video had a dolphin in it. Um, the thumbnail has like a giraffe or something, I think, right? But um, the video shows me using this puzzle uh, generator app. There's actually two different puzzle apps. This puzzle designer and puzzle generator. I believe the other one I used the puzzle generator. It might have been the designer. I forget. Check that video out. But that shows you how you can make a custom puzzle using a different shape. Um, like I brought in a dolphin from the app library and I was able to use uh, one of these two apps. I forget which one to run it and turn it into puzzle pieces that fit into each other. That the overall shape of the end was a dolphin, but each of the pieces um, connected together. And I think that cover, I've never used the basic cabin designer, even though I've got a machine big enough to do it. Um, easels, the Inventables team has been promoting that one a lot. So I, uh, believe it works somewhat well, but I've never personally tried that one to be honest with you. And then as you guys know, there's the image trace, which is the same one that's over here. It's just replicated over here in this area for some reason. Um, it's the exact same app as, as the other importing an image. Uh, it's not the best. I prefer Inkscape. And then the path warp here, it kind of wraps your text, but it doesn't do a great job. Um, Inkscape does so much better. And then the equal spacing tool is pretty neat, as well as the replicator. So if we wanted to um, replicate a shape over and over again, we would use that replicator app. We can actually do it with multiple um, designs too, right? So we could do that and uh, replicate your piece. And we had the spacing was our option though that I that I left how it was 0.5 inches of the spacing. You can do it center line. You can do it with that that discrete spacing. Uh, and then we can take these real quick and jump back over here to the equal spacing app and be able to adjust them as you see fit to space stuff out differently right so that's um how this app here works Yeah, doing your 100 drill holes might have been better to use the replicate tool. And then, uh, oh, I forgot one more thing, right? You mentioned drill holes. So if you're doing like the cribbage board, I think a few, most of you that are here right now watching this live have already seen me talk about this. But the other app in here is the um, convert circles to drill holes. So if you're doing like cribbage boards or you want to use a drill, uh, uh, an end mill, I don't like using an end mill for this but maybe like a ball end bit instead of an end mill. That way it's not so harsh on the tip of the bit as you cut in. 
but we can um, replace all those circles with plunge drill moves, which are a lot more efficient on going straight up and down. So if you had like an eighth inch circle and you want to change it to a plunge drill, so it just goes straight up and down, um, this would do that. And here, if we simulate out, we'll see the toolpaths do just an up and down motion, right? So this takes eight minutes, but if I had the same thing and I had these in uh, as quarter inch holes, then they would take quite a bit. Well, eighth inch holes, I'm sorry. Then they would, one, the bit can't get into a hole that's equal size. The hole have to be slightly larger or the drill bit slightly smaller for easel to calculate out because of the way that it rounds stuff. Um, and it wants to create that circular shape with the um, with the bit as it as it goes in, it goes around there, right? So here we have it highlighted red because it cannot cut that area. So we've either got to make this slightly larger. Two six might work. I think we're getting closer. So we're, we're right about 0.31. Yeah, 0.32 is our size. One point, or 0.132 is our size to be able to get an eighth inch end mill into that hole, right? So we had to enlarge it 0 0.007 for the, um, and you can see here why. It creates a segmented polygon. It, it takes our circle, and the way that easel does the tool pathing, it can't do round corners. It has to do um, squared off tool paths. If you look in this hole here, the tool path itself is kind of squared off um, because it can't do arc shapes. So this tool path here of one, uh, one circle, even though we had to make it larger, right? Let's, let's do a few more. Oh, we're still at one minute. Uh, we'll do more than that. We'll do more than that. Fifty? Fifty holes, right? Fifty holes. Let's see what time we're at with fifty holes. We've got four minutes. So if we took that with four minutes, we converted these all to uh, drill. Holes. We should go from four minutes back to, oops, let me do that one more time. Drill, convert circle to drill holes. We need to replace existing to get rid of those existing ones. And then now we've just got the drill there without a, um, without a circle, right? And for this one here, it's a little bit longer because of the way the step downs work. Every time that it plunges down, it has to lift back up. But uh, it plunges down a little bit. Here, I'll show you that we'll play it through. It'll plunge down, lift up, plunge down, lift up. See how it's going up and down? And that helps with clearing out the material. So doing it the other way, you're likely going to burn the bit up because it's not lifting back up to clear out the material. So even though the other one was faster for this, uh, on this occasion, it's probably going to overheat the tip of your bit and um, burn up the bit, get it dull. Then you'll have bad holes near the end. That are oversized anyway. So this plunging effect where it just goes straight up and down only, and as it comes back up, that helps clear the, clear the chips out, right? So I think that that covers all of my favorite ones, you know? The keyhole generator is a cool app too. Um, there's a there's a video over on Popeye's Workshop that covers how to do that. The video is a little old, but it's still um, is the exact same process now. I think that video is like two years old, but the process is the same when you, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what size end mill you use because it's all it's doing is a plunge, a slide, slide back, and a lift up. So no matter what end mill you size you put in there, it's going to do the exact same tool path. So some people worry about entering the end mill right. How do you enter the, the keyhole, the large part or the small part? It doesn't matter. Um, so 
if you um, if you are using that keyhole bit one, you know that's it. It just it, it doesn't really matter which size um, bit you enter, right? I've actually used this honeycomb one to do a um, this honeycomb one over here to do to kind of get the inverse of it, just the lines to do a uh, a charcuterie board that I epoxied the honeycomb pattern around the outside and not the insides. I mean, that's that just about covers all of it that I was going to go over here today. Um, let me know you guys in the comments below. Otherwise, I think next week I might have to... Uh, I, I didn't... I don't know if you guys saw, but Garrett from IDC Woodcraft did a live stream the other day, and I jumped in on that for a little bit to um, to watch it. I didn't have a chance to stay all the way through, but he was talking about um, with the lady he was talking to about an Etsy shop, right? So I have some tricks on my sleeves about how I set up my woodworking Etsy shop that I I think is going to benefit you guys if you have an Etsy shop set up or any other like large e-commerce platform like that. Um, setting up your own Shopify is a little bit different because you got to bring your own traffic in. Whereas over on Etsy, you're, you, you have to funnel their traffic, right? Um, their customer base is already there. So I've really set up a, my Shopify. It's it was set up okay, and I was able to push traffic there through like Facebook posts and stuff like that. But setting up the Etsy shop itself and some of the um, intricacies of setting it up and getting people to um, to really want to come over to your store and be interested in your products and and and, and buy your stuff and and get them to come over there. Uh, I I kind of want to share that with you guys. We'll probably go through that next week. We might I might even have a chance to do start to finish setting up a shop um, rather quickly, but. Maybe we'll do that next week. Let me know what you guys want to go over. Because um, really, right right now, I'm looking at either that or uh, we need to do, I need to do an aura mask topic as well. But that's probably going to be a whole video that I have to edit through in order to show you guys the aura mask steps. Um, all right. So yeah, thank you guys for hanging out, all of you. I appreciate it. Uh, hope you guys have a great uh, weekend, you know. And hit me up in the other groups that we're in over on Facebook, you know. I'm sure that's where I know most of you from because I spend way too much time on Facebook playing around. Uh, anyway, hope you guys have a great weekend. Take care. I'll see you next Friday, guys.